I'm Cindy Kelly. It is April, uh, Thursday, April 26, 2018, and I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee, with Sam Bell. First question for you is to say your full name and spell it. My full name is Samuel Erasmus Bell, B-E-A-L-L. -L. Some people call Beal, we call Bell. So Sam, tell me about yourself. When were you born and where? It was in 1919. And I will be 99 in just about three weeks. <laughs> wow, congratulations. Uh, I was one nuclear engineer born in Plains, Georgia. Another nuclear was born in Paint Plains, Georgia, named Jimmy Carter, of course. Uh, but I grew up in a nearby town called Richland, lived there until 1940, and then moved to Knoxville, where my, Knoxville, Tennessee, where my mother's family was. Uh, I entered, uh, I said 1940, 1938, and I entered the University of Tennessee, uh, studied chemical engineering and industrial engineering, and graduated from there in 1942, uh, where I was hired by the DuPont Company. And for six months, I worked for them uh, making smokeless powder at the Indiana Ordnance Works. <clears throat> By that time, the uh, Enrico Fermi had taken the Chicago Pile Critical, and the DuPont Company had been selected uh, to do the design, development, and building operational of the reactors required to produce plutonium. DuPont uh, had to get together a lot of its engineers <clears throat> for this project, so they picked me from Indiana <clears throat> and sent me to the University of Chicago in the spring of 1943. And I worked there in the West Stands, just down the hall from Mr. Fermi's pile, uh, where they were still experimenting. Uh, he wasn't there at the time, but uh, uh, we worked there uh, with them and for them. We developed uh, a program <clears throat> for measuring uh, how the ventilation system for reactors, which require a tall smokestack, we worked on a formula for estimating where the plume from that smokestack would touch the ground. <laughs> so that if there were an accident in the reactor and contamination, uh, radioactivity went up the stack, we would determine, we could realize where it was going to land and warn the people there to <laughs> evacuate. <laughs> Anyway, that was uh, one of the things we did up there. And then in the fall, when the Oak Ridge graphite reactor was under construction, uh, they had problems there that required people from Chicago. <clears throat> I was sent there to help with the canning of the uranium pellets that uh, went into the reactor. They had to be put in a can and welded, and they were having trouble <clears throat> uh, with leaks in those cans, which wouldn't be desirable in the reactor. So we worked that out, and then, then I, for the next six months, uh, did ma many things around the reactor. Uh, we were just uh, technical assistants uh, and after that time, 
they decided that I ought to learn about plutonium separation from uranium. And there was a process, process called the bismuth process, chemistry process, that enabled you to take the uranium, dissolve it, remove the plutonium, and leave the radioactivity in the uranium residue. So with that background, I was sent in the fall of 43 to Hanford, Washington, where the reactors were under construction and the chemical plant was under construction. And, and I was there for, I guess, nine months uh, working to separate plutonium. After that bomb was successful, uh, I came back to Oak Ridge. At that time, the idea of forming a material test reactor had been funded, and everybody at Oak Ridge at that time was working on the materials test reactor, the MTR, that was eventually built in Idaho. Uh, so I was responsible for what's called a, a mo hydraulic mock-up, which was really a uh, an assembly, just like the reactor, with tanks and uh, a grid inside for control rods and so forth. We were testing the flow of water through the fuel elements, and uh, we found that the pressure was so great, the fuel elements, which were flat, would bend like that in this mock-up test. And Eugene Wigner said, well, why don't we make them bent to begin with? That way, <laughs> don't have to worry about them bending. Anyway, after a year or more, uh, Alvin asked me to change that mock-up into a, a reactor because we had fuel elements that had been built in the meantime with those curved plates in it. We had enough so that we could do a, a critical experiment in this MTR mock-up. And we did that, uh, made it critical, and everybody's very nervous when a reactor's made critical because it could get away. <laughs> so we had a WAG technician who, right at the time of criticality, blew up a bag and popped it. <laughs> and he almost got fired. <laughs> but anyway, we ran that reactor for uh, well, up to up to a thousand kilowatts, and later it was taken even higher, and and it was operated for years after that. But after we went critical and and proved that a water cooled flat plate enriched reactor uh, was a good idea, uh, and incidentally, at that time Admiral uh, Rickover was in the reactor school there. And he was very interested in this reactor, and he visited it often, and and that was the basis for his choice of the submarine reactors, and and eventually the power react the uh, electric power reactors, water cooled, enriched uranium, uh, which turned out to be very workable. But after six months there, Alvin Weinberg who had always had a, an idea that uh, was very revolutionary. And that is, instead of having a reactor with fuel rods and having to dissolve them back into a solution and separate uh, critical things, he said, well, why don't we start with a fluid fuel reactor? We'll, we'll use uranium sulfate instead of uranium rods. So he asked me to build a reactor that could use a fluid uranium sulfate. 
So we did build one in about 18 months' time that was had a, a tank about this size, surrounded by heavy water, with a pump that circulated the fluid through a heat exchanger, which made steam and could be directed to a turbine, electric electricity. Uh, Eugene Wigner called that a pump, a pot, <laughs> and a pipe. <laughs> he dubbed the reactor, pump, pump, a pot, and a pipe. Anyway, in 1952, that reactor went critical. And for the celebration, which we always did when a reactor went critical, <laughs> Alvin was there with a satchel, and he reached in his satchel and pulled out a bottle of Jack Daniels. He said, Sam, when piles go critical in Chicago, <laughs> they drink red wine, but when they go critical in Tennessee, we drink Jack Daniels. <laughs> so he passed the bottle around there about Sugar Swick. <laughs> well, about a year later, we took that reactor all the way to 1,000 kilowatts. Now this is 250-degree liquid uranium. And at 1,000 kilowatts, we were able to make steam in the generator and feed it to the electrical generator. We hooked it to the TVA electrical system and transferred 150 kilowatts of electrical energy, the first power electricity from a nuclear reactor. So that was a great event, and we've got some metals. I, I thought I brought it in, but I had a metal that we used the electricity to plate a metal <laughs> that recorded that event. And that was such a an, uh, successful experiment. Alvin said, well, let's make a breeder reactor out of this idea of a fluid fuel. So he said we need to design uh, one that will convert uh, uranium, in, I mean uranium-233 into usable material. And uh, so we designed something called the homogeneous reactor test which was a bigger version of the HRE, the smaller one, in the same building and using a lot of the same equipment, but a, a bigger tank, a bigger pressure vessel, a lot of better things. Well, that was great. We went through criticality on that and were taking it up to power. And when we got to full power, 5,000 kilowatts, it suddenly shut down, and that was a shock to everybody because we couldn't figure out what it was. We decided to look inside this vessel where the reaction takes place and found that some of the uranium sulfate had collected, had precipitated and collected in the side of the vessel and it burned a hole about that big in the side of the vessel. And the heavy water from the outside mixed with the fuel and shut the reactor down. <laughs> well, that was pretty bad news, but we continued. We were able to start up the reactor again, a little more concentration in uranium, and we ran it for another couple of years, but the Atomic Energy Commission decided that that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> it was too complicated. We had a we had a chemical separation plant attached to this reactor, so that you know, eventually, if it ever was successful, the uh, purification of the fuel could take place right on site. So it wouldn't have to be shipped anywhere. It's a great idea. It'd be a breeder reactor, and. Uh, <laughs> produce power, but anyway, they decided not to fund it. And our attention then went to a molten salt reactor, 
which had been originally designated for aircraft, an aircraft reactor. Uh, anyway, the idea of using a molten salt uranium was then developed, and, and that reactor ran for two years, first on 235 and next on 233. And it was uh, successful, but at a temperature of 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, very difficult to maintain, and it never did catch on, although I understand that atomic, uh, that the plant in the company, atomic energy, no, California, <laughs> anyway, is, is taking up that idea and trying to maybe produce something in the molten salt category. Well, there are people at Oak Ridge National Laboratory who are talking about working on molten salt. Oh, yeah. Well, they'll never stop talking about Oak Ridge, about molten salt at Oak Ridge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it was fun. And... Uh, uh, I was made head of the reactor division uh, after all that, and uh, we designed reactors for desalination, uh, one for the Army a small package reactor, uh, uh, mol the molten salt reactor. Uh, we had, I guess, ten, 10 or more different versions of reactor that were, came out of that design group and the development group. <clears throat> so that was a lot of fun. Uh, after 12 years as head of the reactor division, with about, I guess, a couple of hundred engineers and technicians, uh, it was about the time when everybody in the, was thinking green and uh, trying to do things that would save energy and make use of solar and geothermal. So Elvin decided to set up an energy division that was non-nuclear and asked me to organize it, which I did after 12 years in the reactor division. And we uh, studied, as I say, geothermal, solar, uh, coal uh, fired plants and did did the uh, safety analysis uh, for all reactors in that one non-nuclear except for the safety <laughs> division. I did that a couple of years and decided that I didn't want to do it any longer and I international development yes asked me to visit several countries who were beginning their atomic energy programs. I went to Pakistan twice. I went to India, South Korea, spent time there getting their programs going in, in atomic energy research. Uh, the Netherlands had a big reactor program that I helped with two years. And uh, and finally, we went to Iceland to see if reactors could displace the geothermal heat there, but they couldn't do it. <laughs> so Iceland is still geothermal. <laughs> anyway, I retired after that, and I'd been into some other businesses, uh, food preparation, frozen foods, and uh, reactors, and... Uh, and restaurants, restaurant business. <laughs> so anyway, that's my history. So what does um, food preparation and restaurants have in common with uh, reactor design? <laughs> Very little. Very little. <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, well, general engineering uh, ideas that fit both. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> how to conserve energy, uh, how to cool things quickly, <laughs> uh, how to mix right uh, uniformly, uh, how to cook pasta by the ton. <laughs> it takes some engineering. <laughs> Anyway, I've been with that company for those years since then, and I was on the board of Ruby Tuesday Restaurant, uh, which my son uh, began and expanded to 12, 1,500 restaurants around the world, and who also started the Black Bear Farm uh, uh, Resort, which is in close by in the next county. So here I am, all alone at 99 years old. <laughs> so what got you interested in, in science? You are an outside... Well, I was in this little Georgia, South Georgia town uh, called Richland. I grew up in Richland, Georgia. We had a, what they call a plantation. Lived mm -hmm. We lived in town, but had the plantation nearby, with big dairy farm, a lot of pigs and cotton crops and peanuts. <laughs> and my father also had a department store, men's, women, and children's uh, clothing and everything. Well, during the Depression, that all went bankrupt. <laughs> but... Uh, in that little town, I learned a lot, and, and I, I got interested in electricity and signed up for a correspondence course in electricity and uh, from the Edison Electrical Institute. And so I studied that uh, during my high school years and didn't continue in electrical engineering, but uh, I decided chemical was a better route. And uh, so when I came to UT, I entered the chemical engineering department rather than the electrical engineering. Turned out well, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. One of the um, observations people have made is that because the first book written about the Manhattan Project, really a booklet, uh, was called the Smythe Report. Yes. That came out right, you know, within I, weeks. I've read it. Uh -huh. yeah. But it talks very, it talks a lot about the physics, because that was commonly known uh, even before the war, um, you know, with the fission discoveries in uh, late 1938, early 1939, that said a number of countries off racing to develop an atomic weapon. But the, the chemistry involved in, you know, the roles you had in separating plutonium, mm -hmm. they're not described in this report. In, in well, part, what, can you explain the, that? Uh, I, I can't imagine why, except that, <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know why it wouldn't I, I be. Think, I think it's because they, they felt it was still top secret. Well, that was a rare process, except that Bismuth's process was a, might have been restricted, yes. I had lots of good friends there, and we had a lot of them move, moved to Oak Ridge when I did, and, and some of them continued uh, to Washington State. Tell me about Elvin Weinberg. Oh, Elvin, <clears throat> he just uh, had great ideas. <laughs> and he was just an all-around good practical scientist. Uh, Eugene Wigner was his mentor and favorite person in the world. They did lots of things together, and... Uh, Alvin was able to, I guess, separate 
the things that needed to be done from the things that weren't urgent. Uh, he ran a good laboratory. He had a a good non uh, well had a good manager named Floyd uh, Color who did all the things that hiring and and uh, management and and he was so good at that that he complimented Alvin in in Alvin's position and uh he was just a well my folder there shows Alvin's birthday celebration oh did you see that <laughs> the photo of you and he on Avia's birthday. Uh, it looks well, like that was it. Yeah, we had a big celebration for Alvin that day. And uh, we had a, a lot of prominent people talk, talk to. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, One of his favorite things was, uh, I want you to come to my house. Let's see. If you'll bring the eggs and come to my house, we'll have ham and eggs for supper if you'll bring the ham. Is that what he said? That's great. Oh, man. He, liked, he likes to get things for nothing. <laughs> So did uh, so Vigner also came to Oak Ridge. Oh yes, he was Alvin's assistant for a long time, and uh, I don't know how he managed to keep him there, but he did. <laughs> they were just such close friends. I think they just enjoyed each other, mm -hmm. uh, and. And I'm sure he used them for the technical division supervisions uh, to back him back up uh, the regular staff, but but I didn't know exactly how uh, Doctor Vigna. I didn't know what his responsibilities were, but he'd come frequently to the homogeneous reactor because that was Alvin's favorite and. And he wanted to, and he was the reason so many of those Nobel winners and prominent uh, physicists came to the HRE because, of course, Alvin knew him too, but Eugene Wigner could attract them to come to see what Alvin has done there. And uh, so we had lots of them to... Uh, it was an interesting, an interesting development, but it just didn't work out very well. A little too complicated. <clears throat> so do you think there's a way to simplify it? Well, it's just the the uh, the fact that the chemistry is now a part of the regular operation, and. Uh, It has problems like corrosion and like precipitation and and composition that let's say commercial enterprises would have a hard time operating a power station with those complications. And that was the biggest thing against the idea, I think. But uh it's still talked about for space use and some specialty things. Uh, nobody's done it yet, but... Uh, <laughs> so you were also involved in the light water reactors, I assume. Well, the light water reactor was the LITR, the MTR uh, involvement. But... Uh, when we were studying 
desalination uh, and and uh, we had uh, of course that was reactor powered to pr produce the heat and, uh, and then we had the army package power reactor uh, one of those were built at McMurdo Sound down in South uh, uh, in uh, Antarctic and ran for years a small water cooled reactor uh, that was designed there along with uh, company com a commercial company I can't remember the name of it that was in the reactor business for a short time but that's about the size of it so did you go to Antarctica to look at this reactor no I didn't but uh, mr. McCurdy who was a project manager did <laughs> in our division <laughs> yeah so the Army had a number of those transportable, small package. Well, we worked on another one for the space uh, system, uh, but it didn't turn out either. It was, uh, it used molten salt, and uh, it's just a tough problem to maintain it and uh, the. Uh, other thing we did a lot of was to look at how to use waste heat. Uh, back in those days, you could run a power station and the exhaust heat coming out of the turbine would just go to heat water and just be wasted. And that's, that's heated, let's say, nearly 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we spent a lot of time studying how to heat cities, and uh, and we had some projects in which the uh, we had a furnace that used that uh, consumed garbage and waste materials, and made steam that was then piped into the downtown cities. Some to heat heat uh, roadways or stadiums melt to melt ice and, and others just to maintain the the process uh, to heat buildings and so forth and we did a lot of work on that had funding from the department of, of uh, the HUD, HUD to finance it uh, we looked at heating greenhouses with it because that was a temperature that'd be perfect for uh, growing growing plants, and uh, th they could be near the reactor, so the heat wouldn't have to be transferred far. Uh, well, those were good ideas, but then none of them <laughs> really <laughs> caught on enough to have somebody invest in them. <laughs> Tennessee Valley Authority actually built a greenhouse and, and heated it with one of their reactors. So that was some progress. <laughs> I guess that is um, so, that's something that some of the scientists were talking about yesterday. Well, as a matter of fact, re heat recovery from gas turbines now is an important, that's really an important uh, part of the system because gas turbines exhaust at high temperature and it's just wasted if you don't heat, don't use it some way. And uh, so that's, that's caught on really well. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> so can you remember any, um, any what, what were your greatest uh, triumphs in all your years working <laughs> great, on these projects. The greatest triumph. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think probably that HRE one was the was the most complicated and the uh, most satisfying one. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, so it was uh, just didn't turn out very well. <laughs> oh, 
sounds as complicated as you say. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. But the, um, you worked on those fuel cladding issues as well. Well, that was very important at the time. Uh, it was afraid that that would keep the reactor from being successful uh, if if those things didn't hold up. Uh, and so we we did some a lot of experiments with uh, cladding and cementing the uranium slugs so that they didn't. Uh, didn't leak fission products out into the stream. And uh, so they, suffi they survived uh, the reactor really well without breaking down or leaking. Uh, uh, see, the, the first graphite reactor at Oak Ridge was air-cooled. Uh, DuPont decided that that wouldn't be a good idea for the big reactors at Hanford. And and so they decided to cool them with water. That's why it was put right next door to the Columbia River. <laughs> uh, and uh, for that reason, at the early stage, we set up some of the, some of the, uh, access holes in the Oak Ridge graphite reactor for the water cooling. We put pipes through it and, and put uh, and, and put uranium slugs <clears throat> in those channels and cooled them with water to to make sure that the Hanford idea would be successful and it was. And uh the fellow in the photograph that you saw in front of the graphite reactor was responsible for that development. <laughs> uh, water cooled, water cooled slugs. <laughs> Mr. Briggs. Mr. Briggs, Beecher Briggs. He was a very close friend and from Chicago and Oak Ridge, and we did a lot of things together. He was. A very smart engineer. <laughs> uh, Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that I haven't asked? No, no, you've covered uh, my life practically. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and there's not much left of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a full life. 99 <laughs> years, almost 99 years <laughs> to count for. That's uh, a lot. That's it's a lot. Been, been a good one. <laughs> yeah. So neither of your well, I know you have two boys. Do you have other children? Three, three daughters. Oh. And they're all great, good cooks and good wives and <laughs> good daughters. Yeah, that's great. We do a lot of things together still. Oh, that's nice. Uh huh. Uh, have a son at. Hilton Head, who has restaurants there, oh. who is, they're not the same restaurants that son Sandy operated. And then another daughter lives up at Braze Island, which is above Beaufort, South Carolina. Another daughter lives in Gatlinburg. And one that lives here, the oldest one still lives here. They're all good, healthy, supporting their papa. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> very, very nice. You're a lucky man. I am that. Very lucky man. Every day is a treasure. Yes. So how many grandchildren do you have? Thirteen grands and seventeen great-grands. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He's going to have a computer to remember all their birthdays. We have a couple of get-togethers every year, and it's 40, 40 to 45 people. <laughs> oh, my. That's marvelous. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what fun. <laughs> oh. Are there any Sams among them? Well, 
we we had I'm Sam two, Sandy was Sam three, and and Sam who ran Blackberry was number four, and his son who is now what seventeen years old is is number five. Oh He's goodness. Sam five. <laughs> wow. So, yes, a lot of Sams. <laughs> a lot of Sams. Oh, that's great. That is great. Wow. Could, could I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Uh, did you work with uh, with um, Raymond Grills or Clarence Larson at all? Who was the first one? Raymond Grills. Didn't know him. I knew Clarence well. Uh, yes, Clarence was involved in a lot of things we did, and uh, I think I have a, might have a picture of him in this. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I have a picture of him somewhere. Because uh, I got an award when I was in reactivating for like 12 years without an accident, and he he was he rewarded me <laughs> with the prize for that. He was a good manager. No, I don't have a picture here. But uh, we had a lot of smart people, smarter than I was, and, and uh, that's why it was successful, of course. <laughs> uh, we didn't mention Miles Leverett, but he was Crawford Greenwald's first, I guess, first choice of engineers. And he uh, headed our reactor division uh, at O&L for many years. And very, very intelligent, smart fellow. So what was it like growing up in Plains? What was? I uh, grew up in Richland. Oh, sorry, Richland. Well, I have to tell you, our postmaster in Richland was Jimmy Carter's grandfather. His name was Jim Jack Gordy. <laughs> And uh, my best friends were Jimmy Carter's first cousins who lived in Richland instead of Plains. And I, I grew up with them. They, they were my mentors and my, <laughs> uh, we participated in all kinds of things. The two, two first cousins and, and their mother was my mother's uh, first friend, best friend and uh, I've been back to Richland two or three times and uh, it's kind of funny Mr. Gordy was the postmaster and he would deliver the mail and the ladies would swear he read their mail and uh, and he was a character and, and they still say Lordy, Lordy, Jim Jack Gordy is an exclamation. <laughs> it caught on somehow those those words and Lordy, Lordy, Jim Jack Gordy, but that was that was his grandfather who was a Democratic postmaster. <laughs> That's good. Was that an elected position? Well, it was an appointed position. The Democrats. When they lost out, the, <laughs> the Republican was put in charge. But uh, in a small town like that, it doesn't. <laughs> like I say, he delivered the mail. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, the, if, were, if, you, if you read it, you, know, you get to know everybody's secret, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, did many of their, your age mates go on to college? Were you? unique and you know going on for advanced degrees or was that common 
Yeah, it was common. I, I did. I, I stayed in graduate school for, well, I took some graduate courses, I'll put it that way, when I was at Oak Ridge. And, and uh have to keep learning if you can, don't you? So did you, um, you were there when Admiral Rickover set yes. up his... Yes, he was in reactor school at the time, and several of his uh, assistants were there also. Uh, they, they were very interested in that LITR, the low-intensity test reactor, but... Uh, People came through O R N L frequently. Uh, prominent people would come and stay for a month or so and do things with the different divisions. Uh, but Alvin ran a good, good uh, science ship. <laughs> Talking about prominent people, you have a couple of photographs of. Um, President Kennedy and Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> but they. Uh, let's see. It. I guess it could be that uh, maybe it did happen through Albert Gore, <laughs> but. We were glad to see them and, and, of course, didn't know that they were going to be even more famous than they were when they came to Oak Ridge. They, he was still a senator at that time. He looks very young in the photo. Uh, and my wife didn't care for Jacqueline, and I had a picture of her with me, and she would she destroyed it. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh dear. So I've forgotten, where did you meet your wife? Here at UT. Uh, she was uh, there after I was, really, but uh, we'd go on events together, football games and so forth. And, she was in the Chi Omega fraternity and the uh, head of it. And I had a lot of friends in that fraternity, that sorority. So it was growing up experience at UT. <laughs> so was she with you in, when, so when you were at Oak Ridge? At that time, uh, no, only after I was in the reactor division, 